Right, earlier on this morning, we considered the first three of the connected speech processes that I was going to discuss with you. We discussed assimilation, elision, and our liaison linking R and intrusive R. We move on now to discuss the remaining ones we listed on the first handout. That is weakening, stress shift, various allophonic effects, and compression. And you should now have a second handout Again, reproductions from bits of Longman pronunciation dictionary. We start with the box headed weak forms. This is something you've already, I imagine, practiced in your classes, both productively and receptively. Practicing making weak forms and practicing recognizing sentences, including them. <coughs> the point being that many English function words, that is grammatical words, have two different pronunciations. They have a strong form and a weak form. The strong form is the one we use when we name the word. The word at. And also the one we use when we stress the word for some reason. In English, we say at school, not under school, kind of thing, <laughs> stressing the word. But most of the time, when we use this kind of word in connected speech, we actually use the weak form. In the case of at, the weak form is first. This is used whenever the word is unstressed and not subject to various special circumstances we shall look at in a minute. And there are some 50 or 60 common words of English which are subject to this kind of alternation. <coughs> they are listed in the <coughs> handbooks of English phonetics. Some of them are in our practice material that you've been given, but by, not by any means all of them. That's really a selection. I know that the use of weak forms constitutes quite a problem for those of you who speak languages that don't have this kind of phenomenon. That's most of you. Uh, there are plenty of languages in the world that have weakening phenomena similar to that of English. Russian is an obvious example. But many languages don't. Spanish doesn't. Japanese doesn't. And anybody who speaks a language that doesn't have it is going to experience problems. Because really we're telling you that Sometimes you can say at, but other times you've got to say at. You've got to remember two pronunciations for the word. Now, does it matter? I think it does matter from two points of view. First of all, perhaps most of all, receptively. If you're not ready to hear weak forms, you will be likely to misunderstand things people say. I'd have done it before. Did you hear what I said? I'd have done it before. What was I saying? Well, if you write it out, it would look like I would have done it before. But I didn't say I would have done it. I said I'd have done it. I'd have done it. That's what we normally do. So you must be able to react to I'd have done it. And here, I would have done it. Some of them have gone. And some of them have gone. Did you get all that? Some of them have gone. Some of them have gone. But I actually said some of them have gone rather fast. Some of them have, and some of them have. And as you can see, what we essentially have is a weakening of the vowel. Some peripheral vowel, like a, moves into the central, so-called neutral, quality of, which makes it more difficult to recognize, it's not so salient, you don't hear it so readily. But if you're to capture the full meaning of an English sentence, you must be ready to hear that. Otherwise, what you will have is semi-comprehension. You will get the big words, the nouns, the main verbs, the adjectives, but you will miss the indicators of tense, the indicators of uh, quantity, some and, and so on. You'll miss the prepositional relationships. 
And you therefore understand part of it, but not all of it. And I think one of the biggest problems for foreign learners of English is they reach this stage of understanding some of what is said, but not all of what is said. And to understand all of what is said, you must be able to interpret to recover these weak forms. That's one reason, therefore, why it's important to know about weak forms. <coughs> the second uh, question we can ask is, does it matter productively? Do you need to use weak forms yourself? <coughs> you might think that it won't cause any problems if you never use weak forms, if you always say everything in its strong form. I would have done it instead of I've done it. And it's true, we can correctly process I would have done it. We understand what you mean. First problem, though, is you sound foreign. And we immediately go into the special mode of communication that we use with idiots, children, <laughs> and foreigners. And, well, that might be something you'd rather not have. Secondly, there are cases where using a weak form, sorry, using a strong form can actually be misleading. Remember that native speakers use strong forms when the word is emphasized for some reason, when the word is accented. Now, if you produce a strong form, a native speaker is going to half expect that you're emphasizing it. If you say, it was ready, instead of it was ready. We hear was, we think, ah, emphasis on was. Now, is that because you're saying it was ready, not it wasn't ready, or it was ready, not it is ready? We, the two reasons why we might emphasize was are, first of all, to emphasize polarity, positive versus negative, was versus wasn't, or secondly, to, um, to emphasize tense, was versus is, was versus hand. So if I hear was, I half suspect that it's one of those two things, and you probably don't have any such intention. Now, by drawing attention to the word was, you inevitably draw attention away from the other words in the sentence you're saying. And that is the danger with using strong forms instead of weak forms. You're giving the wrong signals about what is important in your message. So, if a word like of was is important we use the strong form of was but if as is usually the case it's not important then we use the weak form of <coughs> was so we say a cup of tea a cup, a cup of tea we don't say a cup of tea a cup of tea we say he was ready rather than he wanted it. Right, now let's just look at the uh, general rules concerning when we use weak forms and when we use strong forms. Point two on the handout. The weak form is generally used if the word is unstressed, as is usually the case with function words. A strong form is used when the word is stressed. Sometimes. Okay, so Jim's at lunch. He'll be back at one. No special emphasis on at, so it weakens to that. Jim's at lunch. Jim's at lunch. Not Jimmy's at lunch. <coughs> He will be back at one, but back at one. He'll be, he'll be back at one. When we stress the word, then it's strong, okay? We say at home, not in home. Then, strong form, weak form is complete. I'll invite them round. I'll invite them round. Invite them, invite them round. If I say, I'll invite them round, that sounds as if I'm emphasizing them. I'll invite them round, but I won't invite the other ones. <laughs> Something like that. And that's not what you mean. <coughs> were. Strong form, were. Some people say were. Weak form, were. Just a difference of length, really. Not much difference of quality. But we say, for example, they were delighted. They were delighted. The second transcription on the handout refers to American English, so you can ignore that for a moment. Uh, <coughs> British uh, RP, what we form, they were delighted. If you say they were delighted, we think, why is she emphasizing were? Has somebody been saying they weren't delighted? Oh yes, they were delighted. 
or is somebody drawing a contrast of time? They're not delighted now, but they were delighted previously. If that's not appropriate, we want the weak form of the delighted. But you could say, tell me how they were, where it's the main verb, and therefore it's got to have stress. Well, when do we use the strong form then? Three, one. Apart from stressing, we also tend to use a strong form when we have the sequence preposition pronoun. This is only a tendency, it's not an absolute rule, but it means that when we have a sentence like I'm looking at you, you would tend to get strong at. I'm looking at you. Well, you can have I'm looking at you, I'm looking at you, it's very common to have strong preposition in such phrases. I got a letter from him. Letter from him. Strong from. Also possible, I got a letter from him, but not so usual. I sent a letter to them. I, I sent a message to them. Strong to, because it's followed by prayer. So that's one circumstance. More important and much more interesting linguistically is 3 2 on the handout. When a word is left exposed by a syntactic operation involving the movement or deletion of the word on which it depends. Well, this is something for those who are very interested in syntax because it's a very interesting question why and how this arises. You can think of it simply that when one of these words that has a weak form occurs at the end of a sentence, or at the end of a phrase, the end of a clause, then there is this tendency to use a strong form, even though it's unstressed. So we say, where does he come from? Where does he come from? Nucleus on come, where does he come from? No stress on the form, but strong form, this is at the end. In fact, it's not correct to say, where does he come from? You can't do it. <coughs> Syntacticians will think of uh, an underlying structure B come, comes from X. Sentence formation, WH movement, involves the fronting of this element. He comes from X. What or where does he come from? And this leaves a gap where the complement of the preposition used to be. Prepositions, after all, were <coughs> followed by a noun or noun phrase. If we get a preposition left without one, it's because something's been taken away. And it's when you have this gap after a preposition that you use the strong form of the preposition. Where does he come from? I don't care where he comes from. He's still from. But he comes from London. He comes from Spain. Second example on the handout. I can speak better than you can. I can speak. Sorry about the... <coughs> Mark under the S in the inappropriate transcription there. I can speak weak form, but we don't say I can speak better than you can. No, I can speak better than you can. That can has been left stranded or exposed because it means I can speak better than you can speak. We've got a repeated element which can be elliptic, therefore, leaving a gap after the second can. I can speak better than you can. When we've got a gap after it, we use the strong form. It was aimed at, but not achieved. Well, <coughs> people interested in generative grammar, at least until a year or two ago, used to argue that all passives come from the active. So, <coughs> you've got an underlying structure along the lines of somebody or other aimed at it. Passivization involves taking the it, making it into a new subject, switching the verb around, and you get it was aimed at, now left stranded, with nothing after it, and you get the strong form. <coughs> well, we uh, phoneticians have known about this phenomenon, of course, for a long time, it's been well described uh, in English, but it's only recently that the syntax people have given us this rather plausible account of why it happens. I won't bore you with producing counter examples to show there are certain cases where you get weak forms which nevertheless seem to be followed by a gap, because that's not relevant at the moment. At, at any rate, it gives us a nice 
explanation of what's going on. Well, that's really all the time we've got to spend on weak forms. Let me finish by suggesting certain particularly important categories to remember. <coughs> One category is prepositions. These words like at, from. Nevertheless, there are other prepositions that don't have weak forms. On generally has no weak form. Under, about, and disyllabic prepositions have no weak form. So it's not all of them, just some of them. Uh, secondly, conjunctions. Words like and, but, and also note the behavior of the word that. This has a weak form when it's used to link two clauses. So he said that he'd do it. Some people now call that a complementizer. Others call it a conjunction. Whichever you call it, it weakens in that kind of use. He said that he'd do it. He thought that he'd manage. He claimed that it was right. It's also weakened when it's a relative pronoun. Thus, the man that I saw, the people that I was talking about, the books that I asked you to buy. But when it's a demonstrative, then it has its strong form. Stop that noise. OK, that, I'm stressed. Stop that noise. But it's strong because it's the demonstrative. Just as it is in what's that, who's that. <clears throat> whenever it's uh, used for that movement, pointing. With the uh, personal pronouns, it's perhaps not quite so important because the change is not necessarily so great. But notice that me, he, she, and so on do tend to weaken but in a different way. They don't go to schwa, we don't get mut for me. What we tend to get is a short vowel, me. Tell me what you want. Tell me, tell me what you want. Again, it sounds a bit foreign to say, tell me what you want. No Generally speaking, those can be <coughs> regarded as less important. OK, let's move on then now to the next point, which was five on our first handout. Stress shift. Stress shift. Why am I making a special effort to pronounce it like that? Stress shift. Why is it called a special effort? Well, because this is one of the assimilation environments, isn't it? Like we looked at earlier on. And I really want to say stress shift, which is how I'd say it at any speed. Stress shift. Okay, have a look at what he says on the handout. Some words seem to change their stress pattern in connected speech. Although in isolation we say fundamental with the main stress on meant, and Japanese with the main stress on means. Nevertheless, in connected speech, these words often have a different pattern. For example, there might be greater stress on fund than on meant, or greater stress on Jap than on means. And this phenomenon is what we call stress. Putting words together into a phrase or a sentence involves a kind of reduction of the stress of the early items, really, because of intonation. You've got to choose a nucleus place, and that means that whatever isn't the nucleus sounds relatively less emphasized. So normally, if we take a sequence of adjective plus noun, you get the nucleus falling on the noun. So I've given you an example on the handout of weekly lessons. And this means that weekly doesn't have as much stress as lessons, because you've got a nucleus on less, but merely a head or something on weekly. There's a problem to know how to mark all this. We have to decide whether we're marking word stress for each word on its own, or we're marking sentence stress where we show the relative relationships. At the moment I'm going to show 
relative relationships, some sense of stress sharp thigh shows weekly and less from distress from less weekly lessons. That means that if you've got an adjective like Japanese, isolation pronunciation, Japanese, and that's followed by, for example, people, you'd expect to downgrade each of these, that becomes a tertiary, this becomes a secondary, you'd predict Japanese people. That's not what we say. We don't say Japanese people, we say Japanese people. There are several Japanese students, and you can hear this apparent shift of the greatest prominence onto the first syllable of this adjective. Now, this is nothing special about Japanese. This is a phenomenon that applies to thousands of words in English. In fact, all of the longer words that have underlying it, I would claim more than one stress, are subject to this process. Nevertheless, as I did say at the beginning, the processes I'm talking about today are not categorical. That is to say, they're not obligatory. We can't say that they always have to happen. There's just a strong pressure towards them, a strong tendency for them to happen, and they usually do. So I can't actually say that it's wrong to talk about Japanese people. It's just unusual. Similarly, with our teen numerals, <coughs> if we got the number 16, if I say it in isolation, where's the main stress? What's my say? 16. On the team. Okay, 16. In fact, it's a double stress word. Dictionary entry has to be like that. 16. What happens if we follow it with another word that's got a strong stress? a sailor's song involving 16 men on a dead man's chest. 16 men. Do you notice what happens? 16 men. We get the shift effect. We lose the second stress on the team. <coughs> and generally speaking, whenever one of these double stress words is followed by another word that has a strong stress on its first or sometimes on its second syllable, <coughs> you get this pattern. 16 men. In the handout, we got the example fundamental plus mistake, which tends to give a fundamental mistake. A fundamental mistake. Fundamental. From fundamental. The Longman Dictionary of Contemporary English was the first to introduce a special wedge mark like this to warn you about words for which this stress shift was likely. Uh, in the English Pronouncing Dictionary, Daniel Jones treated them on a sort of one-off basis. That is, he commented on certain individual words where it had come to his attention that this process was likely to happen, but he didn't give it as a kind of regular general rule applying to hundreds and hundreds of them. And uh, in my view, that's what should happen because it's, it's a quite regular process. It's not something applied to certain words only. It's something that applies to all words that meet the structural description that is habit or stress underlying them. Even in the most recent edition of the Longman Dictionary of Contemporary English, Eldos, I would criticize them uh, in as much as they haven't used the wedge mark sufficiently consistently throughout. And in fact, the word fundamental isn't shown with this wedge mark. But it certainly ought to be, because we do say a fundamental error, uh, a fundamental this or that. I've tried to be more consistent in the long pronunciation dictionary. But even there, I'm up against the problem, which words shall I put it against? Because some words hardly ever come in the environment where stress shift applies. Other words very frequently do. And in fact, I decided to do it by reference to their part of speech. Currently, I didn't say this openly, but what I've done is I've put the wedge mark against all the adjectives, because adjectives are typically followed by a noun, which is more strongly stressed. 
I put it against the new worlds, because likewise. But I hadn't, on the whole, put it against nouns, because on the whole, nouns are the head of their own particular phrase, and they're not followed by something else more strongly stressed. I've, on the whole, not put it with verbs, although some verbs certainly arguably could have it. We recently had a new verb come into English, which is what you do with foodstuffs that you're going to sell in Marks and Spencers for people to reheat at home in their microwave ovens. This is this process is known as cook chilling, and cook chill has double stress therefore. Cook chill, <coughs> but it very often comes in the phrase with food following it, the past participle. Then of course <coughs> it's subject to stress shift and get cook chill food and people start worrying about whether they should rightly be as well because of elision, but that's another matter we discussed earlier. <clears throat> but that's an example of how a verb can very readily start following this stress shifting business. I would emphasize that this is something that's quite regular and indeed something that happens in phrases. It's really a consequence of a tendency we have to reduce the middle stress out of three. Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? But what do we say? Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? The big bad wolf? The big bad wolf? We lose the middle one out of three, you see. <clears throat> well, Who's afraid of the Japanese men? It's the same sort of thing. <laughs> <coughs> Who's going to read all 16 books? It also very clearly operates in adjective phrases involving very. That's a very good thing. But at normal speed, that's a very good thing. It's a very good thing. Good loses its stress because it's in the middle of two other ones. Just the same thing with the T numerals and words like fundamental. <coughs> Sometimes we can see a reason here for changes in stress patterns in English. <coughs> Where's the stress on the name of London's first airport? Is it Heathrow or is it Heathrow? Well, I say Heathrow, and it comes as a surprise to you. And indeed, the traditional pronunciation of the name stress on the row. But this is not the first word. Right. And of course, usually this is followed by the word air force, which, car which carries the main stress. And so we get stress shifting here, and we lose the road. So we all say Heathrow Air Force. Because we all say Heathrow Air Force, people coming across this phrase can infer that this word is basically Heathrow. Okay. Just to have the same pronunciation as it would if it were Heathrow. And in fact, we've now got two competing pronunciations, Heathrow or Heathrow. <coughs> when the word is said in isolation, but as long as you put it in the phrase with therefore, then they both sound the same. And so we can see how diversity can arise in a word like this. Let's take an even more obvious case of this. <coughs> in Central America, there is a city whose Spanish name is Barra. Okay, what do we call it in English? Well, some people call it Panama. Double stressed. Others call it Panama. And the Americans in particular seem pretty fixed on Panama. Why do they get the stress wrong? Seeing as in Spanish it's stressed on the map. Because of the hat, that's right. Or because of the canal. Because Panama typically occurs in phrases involving hats or canals, where they get the main stress. So if we've got Panama followed by hat, that's the circumstance when we get stress shift and we lose the mark. 
Panama at Panama Canal. And then people knowing this word only in the phrases Panama at or Panama Canal infer a new and line form Panama because that's a satisfactory explanation of those phrases. And that, I think, is how the word comes to have a different stress in English for many people than it has in Spanish. OK. <coughs> Let's... <coughs> I haven't got anything on the handout about allophonic effects, e.g. double consonants and syllabic consonants, but I put that on the list of topics early on because I wanted to remind you uh, that we do get certain things happening in connected speech and in compound words which are of special phonetic interest. I believe uh, Mr. Winsor Lewis gave you a lecture about plosive releases, and if he did, I expect he mentioned the special case where we have double consonants. If we've got, for example, a good dog, notice what happens to the first D, it gets joined onto the second D so that we produce a single long plosive, a good dog. We don't usually say good to dog, but we never say good to dog. Uh, we say a good dog, a good dog with that long D. But of course, this is something that only applies in connected speech or in a small number of compounds. Within an ordinary simple word, there are no circumstances where you would get a double G sound, double D in the middle of a spelling of a word like ladder, of course, corresponds to a single D sound. So that's a kind of allophonic effect across word boundaries, double consonants. <coughs> it's quite well worth pointing this out and emphasizing it because it's, I think, a regular source of difficulty for some learners. Don't say this is thought. When you've got double S, one at the end of one and the other at the beginning of the next, what we get is a single long noise. This sort. This sort. This sort. And you mustn't make the first S, finish it, this, and then start another one. Sort. This sort. That sounds wrong. Bad. Run it together. This sort. <coughs> If we set up a start fund, you get a long F across it like that. I love viewing television, I think long V. You can think of examples with all the various little consonants, the same kind of thing applies. I love them madly, the madly, the madly long M. One for them, one for the next. Not I love them madly. If you can master that kind of thing, it makes your speech much more fluent, and I think it will be easier to pronounce too. Syllabic consonants we touched on early on this morning. <coughs> There's something that we think of, perhaps mainly, within a word, a word like garden, with a syllabic uh, N at the end of it. But, as I mentioned, the word and very often comes out as a syllabic consonant. If you've got good and ready, tell me when they're good and ready. What you get out of it is see that again, usually good and ready. Because and has a new form, un, un automatically goes to syllabic mm -hmm. when it's after a T or a D. And we looked at examples like up and down, back and forth, and that area. Okay, turn over now to the last <coughs> topic I want to look at with you, which is compression. I created perhaps a slight terminological innovation. I didn't invent the term, but I hope to popularize it. Uh, in bringing together a number of different phenomena under this heading of compression. 
And the essence of what I call compression is a reduction in the number of syllables. The first examples given here, in fact, are all within words. Uh, so let's look at these first of all. The first example here is the word lenient, where we have two possible pronunciations, a slower one, I'm sorry, a slower one, <laughs> I had time for compression, a uh, slower one, a slower one which is lenient, and a faster one which is lenient. Lenient, lenient, three syllables, lenient, two syllables. Second example, diagram. Slower pronunciation, diagram, and the faster one, diagram. Diagram. Third example, maddening. Slower pronunciation, maddening, or possibly maddening, three syllables. A faster one, maddening, two syllables. And as it says, a two on the handout. Generally speaking, the uncompressed version, the long version, is more usual in rarer words, words you don't often use. In slow or deliberate speech, when you're speaking carefully, and perhaps the first time you use a word in a particular conversation or talk, this course. Whereas the compressed pronunciation, the shortened one, is more usual in frequently used words. In fast or casual speech, when you're, you know what you're saying, you're used to it, you've said it lots of times before, uh, it doesn't require any special care. And lastly, if the word's already been used in this course. So if I'm just starting off my geometry lesson, and I say, now, here we have a diagram this. That's the time I use the word, I say it gently, a diagram. But after we've been talking about diagrams quite a bit, I'm not going to say diagram each time. It's more likely to become diagram. Indeed, when I welcome you to the faculty of science, I might say it rather carefully as science, but once we know that that's the name of the faculty, it's going to be the faculty of science. Uh, let's jump down to point seven on the handout and look at what the phonetic changes are, then we'll come back to the other points. So, seven says one of the following phonetic changes takes place when syllables are compressed. Seven one, a vowel is changed into the corresponding semivowel. So, e goes to yod, w goes to w. Um, this is what we had in lenient, becoming lenient. In U going to W is in words like influence, becoming influence. Now, if your native language is Spanish, you may not see that there's any difference at all between them, because Spanish has exactly the same process, and you don't even take any notice of it in regard to it's quite ordinary and normal. English people are on the whole aware that there's a difference between the two possibilities. And it, this is because there are some words that only have the semivowel is a possibility. If we take, for example, the word failure, that's got to be two syllables. We don't have a three-syllable choice for it. It's only two syllables, fail, plus yeah, failure. Whereas, if we take the ending of Australia, then we can have the possibility of Australia, Australia, or we can make it like failure of Australia. Sorry, you can't all quite see that because of the, because of the ball. Anyhow, it can be slow Australia or compressed faster Australia. The fast version rhymes with failure. The slow version doesn't. So that when we ask, does Australia, does Australia rhyme with failure? You can't really give a yes or no answer. It can do, but it doesn't have to. And I think this is perhaps why we're perhaps a bit more aware of this as a uh, something to talk about than speaking the Spanish are. Does it operate in connected speech? Well, yes, this same sort of thing does. 
and try to impress them. I'm trying slowly to impress them. So I use this U without the length marks to indicate the neutralization of the choice between U, just as I used the letter I without the length marks to indicate the neutralization of A, B. Okay. So, has this as its weak form, if you call it a weak form, it all vowels, technical constants. To impress, this is the sort of place where we get impression, when we get a sequence of unstressed syllables. So, rather than to impress, we can pronounce it as to impress. I'm trying to impress. Second, second two, second type of phonetic change, an optional vowel is omitted. Well, you have to know which vowels are optional, and they're shown in the dictionary by italicization. Um, but in practice, this concerns certain schwas uh, and certain diphthongs like I and how when they're followed by a vowel. <coughs> People usually think of this most strikingly in words like fire or power, where we get a sequence. Aya, hour, the fact operates with almost any diphthong before any weak vowel. We know in some sense that it is fire and power. But very often we neglect to actually pronounce the second part of the diphthong in this sort of environment. And rather than saying fire, we can say fire, fire. Rather than saying power, we can say power, power. This is what I call smoothing. If you understand how vowels are articulated, you can see that this is a shortening of the trajectory of the tongue movement in making these particular sequences to avoid the excursion towards the close in or hook position. Ah, ah. And it's these smoothed versions that seem to me to be most likely to be then compressed into a single syllable. <coughs> ah, ah. Indeed, the result may often sound like or even be just a long monophthong. And this is where it's important to know about this from the receptive point. If I use the word power, you've got to be able to recover power from it. It doesn't necessarily mean P-A-R or P-A, though it might be. The, if somebody's talking about par values, you might well be uncertain whether they were P-A-R values or P-A-W-E-R. Similarly, earlier on, I used the word slower, and I pronounced it, did you notice, as slur. Slur. I was doing the same sort of things. You've got O plus R. I was neglecting to make the second part of the diphthong before a weak vowel. So instead of slower, I was saying slur. One of the kinds of assimilation we looked at this morning was called coalescence. That is, coalescence. So you must be able to recover the diphthong from these smooth versions of it. That's really, I think, the point here. Uh, the other type, 7-2, involves a syllabic consonant really losing its <coughs> syllabicity, so battling becomes battling, listener becomes listener, and so on. And 7-3, uh, the third type is that we can get uh, a long vowel, E or U, becoming the corresponding short vowel, I or U, before a weak vowel. So rather than agreeable, we can say agreeable. Rather than ruinous, we can say ruinous. And this means that if we have a phrase like, what's the time, always? Three o'clock. Lots of people might say things like it's three o'clock. It's three, three o'clock. It just sounds like an ear is from out of this rather than three. Uh, 
o'clock, you can get the three o'clock. Or if it's one hour earlier, it might be two o'clock. Two o'clock. So again, your problem is that of correctly recovering three o'clock out of three o'clock, or two o'clock out of two o'clock. If we can now work upwards to point six, just above, sometimes a pronunciation that was originally the result of compression has become the only possibility. Well, you can see plenty of instances of this in English. Simple, comparative, you'd expect simple though. But we actually say simpler. Now that's the result of compression, but it's become lexicalized, it's become fixed, and you've got to do it now. It would be wrong nowadays to say simpler. It's got to be simpler. And uh, sometimes, indeed, this is obvious from the spelling, because the spelling takes account of this sort of thing. I mean, think about a word like angry. Now, you know this comes from anger. It's formed by adding the suffix spelled Y to anger, but we don't say angry. We say angry, and that's because it's become absolutely established. Similarly, wintry is to do with the winter. Sometimes, though, people are not, not so sure about it. You will sometimes hear people saying wintery, because after all, it's parallel with summery, and we could certainly say it's three syllables. <laughs> we don't have words springy or autumny. I don't know why. That's just the arbitrary nature of English. Uh, and indeed, people sometimes get uncertain about the spelling. <coughs> Standard spelling is disastrous from disaster, but every now and again, you see people misspelling it Presumably because they say, or can say, disastrous, even though that's not a standard pronunciation. So perhaps not everybody has categorically <coughs> completed these uh, <coughs> compressions in places like this. One last point. We have certain words in English where we have a verb and an adjective with identical spelling, but different pronunciation. You probably know that the A-T-E suffix is pronounced eight in verbs, so the verb is to separate, and the verb is to moderate. But in adjectives, we get a weak suffix, and some people say it, most people say it. So the adjective is separate and moderate. However, because we've now got separate is a kind of situation where you typically get compression. What people usually say is actually two syllables, separate, moderate. And that therefore enhances the compression phenomenon, enhances the distinction between the adjective and the verb. The verb is to moderate, the adjective is moderate. The verb is to separate, the adjective is separate. All these things interact together, uh, and that's why, although we discuss them one at the time, we have to remember that they all go together at the end. Right, those of you who missed the earlier handout, I've got some more copies made, otherwise that's it. Thank you very much.